Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jeff Bucci. I'm with RCR Wireless News. I'm the uh, editorial director of RCR, and I'm delighted to be here with the great panel. Uh, this session is sponsored by CDG. Um, the focus is going to be on um, key challenges and opportunities for CDMA 2000 LTE operators. Specifically, we're going to have a bit of an economics bent to this discussion and hopefully help folks understand how to maximize your ROI investment in LTE. Uh, the way this is going to break down today is we're going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves, talk about some key trends that they're seeing, and then we'll have a group discussion with the carriers and OEM uh, vendors. Uh, then we'll move into a couple presentations by CDG and um, TNS, TSNI, right? TNS. There you go. We uh, also want to take a minute to recognize our sponsors. We have Axel Lucent, Ericsson, Huawei, Nokia Siemens Networks, Qualcomm, and ZTE. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rob to uh, kick us off. Um, I'm Rob Reardon. I am the Executive Vice President of Cellcom. We're a uh, cellular provider up in Northeast Wisconsin, uh, covering about uh, about a third of the state of Wisconsin in our footprint. Um, we are a member of the LRA group with Verizon, so we have LTE launched. Uh, we already have services in our area. In other words, people are using our using Verizon Spectrum, but our equipment to complete their calls. Um, we also <coughs> are working. Uh, have a close relationship with Sprint, looking for their rollout for LTE. We have our own spectrum and plan to roll out our own spectrum, obviously, for LTE. Um, the last thing I guess I wanted to ask you just kind of what are our concerns and what are our thoughts. Our concerns are that we need to be in the space. We need to be playing in LTE, and if we're not, we're going to find ourselves um, at a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, because obviously the world is going to go away and there won't be any business for us. So we found different ways to play. But LTE is not the only solution. Uh, LTE will give you about a 10 times increase in capacity. We're expecting to see a thousand times increase in need by the year 2020. So you've got to find something just beyond LTE. Additional spectrum, some spectral efficiency with LTE will get some of that with advanced. And the final thing is small cells. Uh, we think with using small cells, femtocells, the HEPnet, uh, and LTE, we can survive. Um, so we're we're looking at and are rolling out technologies along those arenas. All right, uh, I'm uh, Egil Gronstad. I am uh, Vice President of Technology Planning for Cricket Communications, or also known as uh, Leap Wireless. Uh, as we are uh, rolling out our LTE uh, solutions, one of the uh, big challenges that we're looking at and trying to work through uh, is uh, how to optimize uh, investment decisions around uh, technology transition solutions. You go from a CDMA uh, based network solution uh, to LTE, there's a number of different uh, technologies, optional technology solutions that has been standardized and specified in order to help in that transition. Um, but the problem is that uh, it seems like the uh, large CDMA operators are choosing different path. So uh, for smaller carriers, it's very important to understand these aspects. I'm talking about things like uh, do you use CSIM for provisioning of uh, the legacy network? Do you implement EHRPD? Do you implement uh, ECSFB or do you implement CSFB or do you implement VCC and you do dual radio VCC or single radio VCC. There's a number of different things and these decisions may um, be very costly and they may lock you into one path that could either, either give you an opportunity or prevent you from getting on the best possible ecosystem for handsets, uh, getting interoperability for roaming, with uh, other partners, uh, so, so it's it's very very important topic, and I'm I'm frankly a bit disappointed that in the CDMA industry we haven't had any strong force that have stepped up and taken control of this and tried to make everybody choose the same solutions. If you compare to the GSM industry, GSM has the GSMA which is a very powerful body in the industry and they're just 
getting everybody on the same path. It's not so in CDMA, and it's something to be aware of and that we absolutely um, should be working on together. There is a lot of visibility around all the different spectrum bands and fragmentation as it comes to different spectrum bands being used for LTE, which is great, but those are much easier issues because there are lots of visibility around it. All these other things I was mentioning, all these acronyms, there is very little visibility to it. And it it's very important to address. I'm Tracy Dwyer. I'm Senior Director at Alcatel Lucent, responsible for wireless product management. Um, my background is I joined wireless in 1998. I worked on CDMA. It was a phenomenal experience. You know, always being part of CDG and what CDG was, was bringing to um, the industry. And then I went and worked on LTE, and then I came back to CDMA. Why? Because um, we need that extra help, as Ego was saying, that you know we need that extra help of how do we get our CDMA customers to LTE. It needs a special focus. So the things that I'm working on right now are the structural efficiency features, deploying those with the customers, EVDO advanced, um, 1X advanced, and helping to basically use that existing network as efficiently as possible as we try to grow in LTE. The challenges with LTE is that as it gets deployed, we already start talking about capacity and running out of capacity, as, as uh, was just discussed by Rob. And so one of those areas that we're attacking very aggressively is small cells. So I've also been working with small cells and heterogeneous networks for LTE and integrating those into CDMA LTE networks. Uh, I'm Syed Jedi with Huawei Technologies. Uh, my role is uh, the Director of Technical Solutions at Huawei. I have a pretty long uh, career in wireless as well. I started out with TDMA and then product management for CDMA and uh, now LTE. So, you know, from our perspective, you know, we are pretty much focused on LTE deployments uh, worldwide. Uh, you know, the key focus for us is LTE is in its infancy, and uh, CDMA and LTE networks will coexist for a very long time. The, the key issue for us, how do we introduce LTE in various environments? A lot of carriers are spectrum limited. So how do we actually use the advanced CDMA features like 1X Advanced to basically clear some spectrum, introduce LTE, and then what features and uh, functionalities we can introduce to help the operators maintain the two networks uh, in a very cost-efficient fashion. Uh, so just like uh, Tracy, you know, we are focused on all of those CDMA, advanced CDMA features, introducing LTE, uh, small cells, we have some uh, actual small cell deployments. So, you know, those are all the key areas, and the other, other key area for us is to make sure that, you know, as we introduce uh, these new functionalities, uh, we are also helping the operators reduce their cost as well as improve the quality of experience for the end user. Because, you know, from the end user perspective, <coughs> whether it's CDMA or LTE, it doesn't matter. You know, what they're looking for is a seamless seamless uh, experience, uh, whether they're being served by CDMA or LTE. I'm Patrick Castillo, I'm a business development manager and director for Qualcomm based in San Diego. And uh, as a technology enabler for our OEMs and operator partners, we're really focused on supporting the LTE ecosystem right now, making sure that both the CDMA operators and the LTE operators right now are getting the support they need in the chipsets. Um, we uh, obviously have a lot of complexities in the, in the banding situation for LTE, a lot of new bands coming through 3GPP that we're going to support from an RF perspective. Uh, that's a big challenge. And the other thing I think we're really focusing on now that was referenced by Ego was the 1000X uh, uh, data challenge. And uh, we're also very bullish on small cells. Um, Providing multi-mode small cell support and uh, network densification, and, uh, and we're eager to meet that challenge as a supply. My name is Joe Lawrence. I'm with the CDMA Development Group. We now go by CDG. So I am representing the CDG here at the Competitive Carriers Association, and I'd just like to let you know that I appreciate the remarks that Egil Rostad has just made earlier. 
if you grew up in the CD Bank community, we were all about differentiating ourselves if you were an operator. That was how we, we entered it in as a competitive edge. Whereas GSM was all about the common global standard, global vanilla flavor, served to everyone else. But we're at a critical point right now when it comes to the deployment LTE where we're coming together on a single mode, a single modulation scheme, but we're fragmenting ourselves on a global basis with all the different implementations. And so you're, this, this seminar, I'm very encouraged as a host of it to start talking about some of those issues with you and how we can come together with a common platform that will enable their interoperability and most specifically in implementation of LTE roaming. And that's what I'll be discussing here towards the end of this seminar is LTE roaming. Hello, I'm Joe Deccan. I'm with uh, TNS, Blue Product Strategy and Development Group. My role is to come up with solutions for the evolution between technologies and carrier services. So our role today, um, we had a seminar earlier today was how to maximize your existing core in the CDMA space as well as how to transition you uh, to the new core. Uh, a lot of folks are making progress, so we're in the middle of kicking off some LT trials and to help operators monetize the both. Okay, great. Uh, so now we're going to move into a general discussion with the operators and the OEMs talking about, uh, again, more of an economic slant with respect to deploying uh, LT. And let's uh, start out by uh, asking Abel a question. Earlier you mentioned customer experience, uh, maybe, and you also mentioned CSFB. Can you talk a little bit about whether or not you're deploying East, uh, CSFB instead of CSFB and what impact that's going to have on your customers? Yeah, so let me talk a little bit about that. So. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, neither CSFB or ECSFB is available from the infrastructure vendors uh, today for CDMA. A little bit as I alluded to before, for the GSM operators, that, uh, that the technology was available day one when LTE was, uh, was deployed. So for us, it's not available, so we, we were essentially forced to go the same route as the largest uh, CDMA operator in, in the US, they, they were the one who pushed the industry and told the vendor what to develop, and they went with a solution where you require dual radio in, in the handset in order to be able to handle calls between uh, LTE and, and CDMA. So, so, so techno that technology is not available for us yet. Uh, we do believe that uh, it is a necessary for us to implement um, either CSFB or ECSFB. Uh, certainly ECSFB is more advantageous from a, from a customer experience point of view. Uh, but this, the technology is not going to be available until, until next year. Um, so at this point in time, that is our plan to implement that uh, for two reasons. One is to reduce the complexity of the, of the handset. And the other reason is to align with uh, with our current uh, largest uh, roaming partner in, in the U.S. Now there is a bit of a sort of uh, issue around that because the other large U.S. CDMA operator going to LTE is not implementing that. So if if the FCC at one point in time uh, start reinforcing what they have refer to as um, needing to offer reasonable data roaming rates, meaning that we actually could get a favorable data roaming rate in place from, um, from, from other operators in the US, then we might have gone down a technology path that does not fit with that operator's uh, technical solution. So, so that's why I'm, uh, I think this is a, uh, a big challenge that is very unfortunate that we, we have, uh, but at this point in time, yes, we're going down that path in order to align ourselves with the current uh, largest roaming partner that, that we have. If I can just comment on that also, um, originally I wasn't going to comment on the comment, but during the question, but, but <laughs> let me let me just say that the biggest problem our engineering team is having along these lines is the exact one that you're talking about. Um, we don't have a clue where the chips are going to fall, and we can't afford to make a lot of playing around with mistakes. I mean, the big guys can throw a lot of, you know, millions of dollars down the wrong rabbit hole and not worry about it. 
we can't afford that, and I don't think anybody in this room can, uh, quite frankly. So, you know, we've got to get our act together. It's just driving me nuts. So I just want to pass it. I agree. Yeah. It, it comes to roaming. It comes to potential network share opportunities in the future, and MA activities, all kind of things will play into this, and and you can. Uh, really run into that that, that rattle where you're losing a lot of opportunities. It's even know. stopping or slowing down the whole deployment because you're waiting for the right solution. Absolutely. Why don't we uh, give the OEMs a chance to uh, talk and then we're going to have uh, GS, our new addition to the panel, introduce himself <laughs> afterward. But while we're on a roll here, we clearly hit a hot button with some of the operators. So I'd, I'd love to hear the OEMs uh, give some sort of response. Yeah. I mean, I think ES, ECSFP is, is critical. And I think the rush to LTE to get it out there pushed a lot of the functionality into the device was <coughs> not really sustainable. So now as an industry, we do have to address it. Um, it needs to be there, it needs to be there in the infrastructure. And with the LRA program that's being started, what does this mean in terms of more broader support in roaming for ECSFB? I mean, it's definitely a big question that needs to be tackled. Yeah, I think I agree with that. But uh, again, ESSB is one of the one of the architectures that can be taken forward, right? But we saw that there are smart things that can be done even in the device side that you can see from Apple. Mm -hmm. They were able to do that without requiring all the complexity in the, in the network. So there are two ways. Again, something that the CDMA guys have been doing from day one, EVDO and 1X, always work together and worked on the same principle that Apple has been able to do. That's right, you know, uh, CSRP is in the works and it will be made available soon. Does anybody have a question about CSMP? If I know, well aware of the issue? Okay. Uh, I just want you to introduce yourself. Go ahead, John. Uh, so for on the topic, so ECSFB is enhanced CSFB. Yep. And I heard earlier from uh, Say we really have to concern ourselves as operators and vendors <coughs> with the consumer experience. So if you go with CSFB, you're going to have a hard handoff. It's going to be a switch from your LTE to your circuit switch voice, which is 1X. And that's not a good user experience. So that's why ECAs. FB was developed so that it would be a soft, seamless handoff, which will most likely be if you adopt circuit switch fallback, the method to use, and I'd love to hear from the vendors when that will be available. So we have to preserve the existing roving remedies you have on your 3G network, and you want to provide the same user experience on your 4G network. And if we don't do that well, then we're going to have bigger problems than interoperability. Any other comments? Yes. Please. I'd like to uh, provide a comment to my colleague here from Ericsson. So what you said is very applicable because Apple is using dual, some kind of dual radio solution and it's, a, it's, a, it's like a $600 device. So yes, if you can, if you can uh, afford to pay that much for a device, yeah, you can pile on lots of different stuff. That's fine, but that's the, our business is not uh, sustainable on uh, focusing our, 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 our business on $600 devices. We, we need to simplify the device solution, get the device cost down, and uh, yeah. So, so, so we need we did need a different solution. Patrick, you're going to weigh in? I just want to comment that um, as the chipset provider, we'll be supporting both technologies, obviously. And we do see CSFB, ECFB, ECSFB uh, coexisting with uh, LTE voltage for a long time, <coughs> not until voltage matures um, and gets broader coverage. I think we'll we see those transitions. That's, that's a good point because a lot of people right now from the journalism world, the media, they're saying, well, which is it? Is it going to be a voltage or is it going to be enhanced circuit switch fallback? Which one's going to win? Well, it's just what Patrick said. I think they're both going to coexist, just like 3G, 4G are going to both coexist. There's no winners or losers here. We'll all be losers if we all try to do things differently. And, and don't consider the full uh, spectrum of options to make sure we do have that rolling and So GS, please introduce yourself. Yeah. I'm GS Sikan. I'm actually uh, Director for Custom Solutions at uh, Ericsson. And I primarily work with most of uh, the service providers out here. It's basically tier three. And they are, I mean, they have unique issues compared to the, re I mean, the regional players have very unique issues compared to the big guys, and as, as I think uh, Robin and some of the others mentioned, that they can throw in millions of dollars 
but for most of the regional players, it's something that uh, it's just not, they don't have that as a luxury. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned um, <coughs> the cost of devices and Apple solving the issue with uh, an expensive device. One way. One way. Uh, Rob, this question is directed to you. Um, um, can you talk a little bit about handset subsidies and the impact it has on your business? And I will note that Cellcom this week is rolling out three smartphones, including the, the i5, i5 on Friday, right? Correct. So Correct. talk about the economics of, of uh, the iPhone and then why you should move forward with it or not. Well, the economics of, of all of what we're talking about <coughs> subsidy, basically we have for each of the and it reeks. I mean, it's damn expensive. But the question, I guess, you have to ask yourself, is it worth the cost? And can I avoid doing it? Um, and quite frankly, we we don't know that it's absolutely as big a killer as you think it is. Um, it certainly hits the bottom line. It certainly does cause uh, some high expense items. We've seen that when we rolled out the the iPhone, for example, and this is not uh, any state secret, uh, somebody walks in and buys an iPhone, and they also buy two accessories. I don't know about you guys, but the margin on those accessories is nothing to sniff at. It really is not bad. Uh, so now I've already got some of my subsidization taken care of at that point. That's on average. That's on average. I may have people buy three or four of those silly things when they walk in, but rarely does somebody walk out without buying an accessory with an iPhone. I don't know why they don't with an Android, other than maybe the fact that the Android isn't as standard. Uh, you know, everybody's got it and they all fit it, uh, is the way the iPhone is, and it's very iconic. So that's one thing that helps us with the subsidization. The other part of it is, is that when they do it, they're buying a data plan. And you know what? When you've got an Android that works really, really well and works really fast, or you've got an iPhone that works really, really well and works really fast, they use data on it. And they use it like crazy. And they pay us a lot more for that. And they buy bigger data plans if you use some of the plans or if you've got a, uh, you know, one that's, that's just everything. Uh, we've got a two gig plan. We don't believe in a totally free beyond that. But people buy it and they use it. So we're getting our phones paid back. Uh, it takes a little bit of time, but we're definitely within a year, we're covered back on it, and we're making money on those guys in the second year around. So, is it worth it? I've talked, I had dinner last night, one of the guys I was sitting with, nice discussion. His company had a hard time pulling the, the plug and deciding whether or not they're gonna go for those expensive devices. They sat on the sidelines and sat on the sidelines to the point where now they can't get the devices. We sold more iPhones than we sold of any other device the day that we opened the door. Well, we had given away Androids on a Black Friday a few years earlier. So is it worth it? Yeah. Yeah, we're, it's, it's definitely um, definitely worth the money. I hate to say it, but it is. The other thing I'm going to mention, by the way, too, is that one of the advantages that usually we wait for, we're still waiting for the Samsung, um, uh, latest and greatest Samsung phone. But a week after the iPhone uh, came out to the big guys, uh, we're rolling it out. So it's the first time we've been on the same level playing field that's out there. And I'm kind of hoping the rest of the OEMs will get out and realize that building one generic phone that really, really works and makes it available for all of us is much better for them, much better for the infrastructure. And they will find themselves being a lot more iconic when they stop being very specific to given carriers. Thank you. <clears throat> we talked about mobile data, mobile data tsunami. Somebody mentioned 10x growth in mobile data before. Um, I love this is directed at the, the uh, operators for a minute. Uh, what mobile data services are producing the most gross margin for you, and how do you see that changing over the next three to five years? Well, as far as most, you know, is there a killer app out there? Not really. I mean, SMS certainly came out well for us initially, and now we're, we're seeing videos going, but all that's doing is draining our networks. We need to find a, a mechanism that allows us to get. Um, uh, that we can control our own destiny. So do we have a solution today? No, but where do we see it going? Um, right now, think about this. You can buy a camera, put it into your house, and have the photos of your kids coming home uh, show up on your cell phone. Wouldn't it be nice to know they got home? Wouldn't it be even more nice to know that their, your son's girlfriend showed up at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> or that somebody else you don't know showed up and walked in the front door? So there, it's self-created type of data services going over your network that you can have a piece of. Those are the kind of things we're looking at down the road. There was a speech earlier given by Mavenir. Uh, Doc was also got some of the solutions where you can do a lot of additional type services that bring people back to your network. 
we're losing voice as a switch circuit network, why don't we take and grab that voice, maybe over a uh, voice over IP or something else, and offer new services to it. We need to look at and be broader in focus. The last thing I want to mention is, is machine to machine. We're going to be aggressively getting more and more into the machine to machine world. Now, one of the problems you run into with machine to machine is we don't have a nationwide network. So you say, how can we play in it? Well, you lean on guys like our friends from Qualcomm because, quite frankly, they've got some geniuses down there doing some great things. We look at ways in which we can get a CDMA chip. Uh, and by the way, the question is, is it going to be CDMA or LTE? We think it's going to start out as CDMA. It doesn't need a lot of bandwidth. The problem you've got in the long haul, will CDMA be here in 10 years? If you're working with a power company, they want to know it's going to be here for 20 years. If you're working with somebody that's just got a smaller device, it might be that you can live for that five or six years and CDMA may be around. But the question comes back to it is, can we play? We have ATMs around the entire United States right now on our network. Why is it? Because we charge them more than our partners charge us for that roaming revenue we're able to put that someplace else. So the possibility for a river of pennies is there. We just have to find the right mechanism for getting the radios into those devices. Hey, what are you seeing on the both lane side in terms of, uh, again, economic impact to your bottom line? So uh, clearly a larger and larger portion of our revenue comes from, from data, various data services these, these days, and a uh, large amount of that traffic is video. Uh, as far as profitability, uh, it's hard to make video profitable because it's so high usage and so big strain on the network. So as far as the uh, profitability, you know, probably uh, text messaging is the most profitable service. Right? People are still using that a lot, and, and it's very cheap to deliver it. And uh, if you look at the younger people, we, we tend to skew to, to youth a lot, and uh, they hardly use voice services these days, right? So it's, it's more and more going, going to data. Patrick, I'd love for you to weigh in on, on yes, this, sir. and we'll come back to the OEMs as well. What are you seeing some of the carriers do, North America and globally, really uh, drive both data uh, gross margin? Yeah, so well, since Rob referenced this specifically, I don't think qualifies for it. It's really true at Qualcomm, but um, you know, we're, we're very ambitious in the MDM space. Our vision is Internet of Everything. Everything's going to be connected. Um, we recently reorganized our part of our chipset division to focus exclusively on MDM, so we have a fully fully tiered, fully tiered uh, featured roadmap to support all use cases up in the LTE for automotive high bandwidth applications all the way down to low bursty, bursty applications for energy or whatever it might be. So um, we're fully prepared to address um, whatever use cases in the market needs to address. Tracy, you want to comment on what you're saying? Uh, we'll just I, go down the line. I mean, I've, our Bell Labs business modeling team tells us we're going to see 70% of the network video by 2015. So it's definitely, you know, what we're trying to address with infrastructure solutions. As a consumer, you know, M2M, you know, if you go buy a car, I just recently uh, had a new driver, so we had to get a car. And, you know, right there, they're, they're selling you this M2M capability. Um, it happened to be using the CDMA network, which was in the brochure. Um, and just, it make, they make you feel like, you know, just the safety aspect of it, you know, having those applications where you can see your kids coming home from school or have an SOS capability in the car or geofence and just getting a text message if the car is speeding. I mean, it almost feels necessary. You know, so having it there and as a consumer, I mean, I think definitely monetizing the <coughs> capability is something that, you know, the operators need to do and we're supporting that with the <coughs> Yes. Yep, so, um, so I agree with Tracy that video is going through the roof. It is, but then I think there are some more very early, clearly said that uh, by 2020 you'll have 50 billion connected devices. Those are not going to be wrong, you know, like cell phones and regular subscriptions. It's going to be machine to machine. Anything that needs to be connected to the network will be connected to the network. And I think uh, Ericsson is, is in the forefront to actually believe that, and we are doing a lot of things in the network that actually will enable that. Because it's, it's a totally different way of connecting totally different way of bringing the subscriber up. It's not a regular subscriber, so a lot of things have to be automated, and uh, there's a lot of work that's going on. Okay, well, let's give um, Huawei a chance to, to weigh in there if you'd like, uh, in sure. terms of what you guys are doing to help carriers. 
Yeah, I mean, so so video is definitely the big key, but you know, from our perspective, uh, what we are looking at is you know, how do you actually monetize it? How do we give the tools to the operators to monetize video? So you know, we have we have some you know, you know, some, some features and algorithms, things like that, that we are allowing uh, the operators to basically look at all this stuff and uh, give them tools and mechanisms to basically charge extra for those video operators. Well, Patrick, you're right in here. Yeah, I think uh, you know, video is key um, with the demand coming on video. One of the one of the things that I think we need to move together as an ecosystem on are things like EMBMS and broadcast. So, um, you know, that's going to provide the operators some um, abilities to monetize some of those services, um, offload some of that video. Uh, you know, whether it's e-media distribution or even file updates, firmware updates, key app updates over broadcast. And uh, really find a way to monetize some of the We've got about seven minutes left in this section. I want to get a couple of topics. Uh, we've got customer ex uh, experience. We talked about um, <coughs> subsidies. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about EVDO DAS and how EVDO DAS is helping uh, carriers with um, uh, really reducing cost and freeing up spectrum or refarming spectrum. Um, I'll offer it to the operators first, and maybe we get some comments from the. Uh, sure. Um, we have deployed a number of DAS networks. Uh, to be honest with you, we don't view it as a, a tool in our toolbox to save money, really. It's, uh, uh, it's, it, we, we view it as a fairly costly solution compared to uh, traditional uh, macro networks or, uh, or, uh, or small cell deployments. Uh, we have deployed DAS networks, we're using DAS networks, it's mostly been uh, for a, a uh, trigger by time to market uh, to be able to get the networks deployed and up, uh, up and running and starting to generate revenue early. Um, but that, we, we, if we can avoid doing DAS, we will avoid doing DAS. So I, I don't see that as a real uh, opportunity for us. Uh, when it comes to you know, running a profitable business. How about small cell and, and, and pinto cells? Yes, absolutely. Small cells, I, I, uh, we, we definitely see that as an opportunity to, in order to grow the capacity on the network, yes, to, to start to layer um, the cell structure. We, we, have, we uh, have started those kind of deployments and we see that as an important tool in the toolbox as we continue to develop, uh, evolve the network. We are, um, we've been a strong component for the Fendo cell and the small cell since day one. Um, I'm not a big fan of DAS, uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, Lambeau Field is an example of it. You may have heard of it, uh, it's a football <laughs> team that plays there. Uh, in any case, um, being in Green Bay, we've got the Packers there. We have three cell sites pointing at Lambeau Field. It worked really well a few years ago when people didn't use their phones. Now that everybody in the world is on their phone, Everybody has congestion issues. There's now a DAS system being installed and there are millions of dollars put in to put in this wonderful DAS system. Mm -hmm. I could put in 20 Femta cells, uh, a, um, a commercial or enterprise version of it, uh, spread it throughout the entire building. Uh, and it costs less than $10,000 each, or dramatically less than $10,000 each. So a fraction of the cost of what was put in for the DAS system uh, and give anywhere from 10 to 15% uh, increase in the capacity on the network over what a DAS system can do. Uh, and then on top of it, I'm not having to put in a, a, a coax to do it. I can use Ethernet, which is pretty cheap to put up there. Uh, and my backhaul could be done over an internet pipe, but probably in that location wouldn't be. Um, Qualcomm uh, has developed and shown on their, on their campus site, uh, they put in uh, seven different uh, FEMDA cells in the building. You've got a chance to drive around the campus and see that you have better quality of service off of their FEMDA cell network than those off the macro cell network. Uh, they're showing in slides at a show, so I'm not telling anything outside of school, where they saw that you could take and get a, uh, with 10% of a neighborhood having FEMDA cells in it, uh, you could have a 23 times data increase through that. And the cost of that had a fraction, a incredible fraction of what you're gonna be paying for it with a DAS system, which you wouldn't be able to use in the neighborhood, but uh, in the in the uh, arena, you certainly would. At a fraction of the cost, you've got a much more capacity. So uh, to say I'm excited about them to sell, we've already got a platform where I put it into a bunch of our employees right now. We're in the final trial stages of it. 
Uh, my employees have told me anything from uh, it works just as well as the macro system goes. That's the worst sound we got. The, uh, the best was out of my cold dead hands you'll get this damn thing when you want it back after the trial's over. Um, being the other extreme of that. But quite frankly, I have an 83% of the people that have it in their place are saying that they would recommend it to somebody, and that's astronomical. People don't normally say that. So 83% of my people would go out and say, you have to get a to cell, and they've got it in. So yeah, we're big on it, not on DAS. Well, let's talk a bit to the OEMs about uh, not just EBDO, EBDO DAS, but let's uh, have some latitude to talk about small cell and offload as a whole, and how you're how you envision helping the competitive carriers really maximize their investment and profitability? So um, we have, I mean, definitely Femtos have brought a lot. To, they've been in the marketplace for a while in terms of indoor coverage. Um, it's been uh, great. I think what we have to have to take on um, with small cells is really the outdoor environment and bringing that capacity that of LTE to the user. And that's what we're tackling with small cells. So in terms of the technology, it's here. We have you know multi-core processors and you know smaller profiles to get that access point to be as small, so we can flexibly deploy it. But we still have the challenges that are probably 80% outside of the box, and that is, you know, how do you get back all to it, deploy it, um, solve it, you know, in a stadium environment? How do you make it neutral host? Um, a number of different solutions that are you know outside the access point so what I'm glad we're doing is we're aggressively beginning to deploy small cells in multiple architectures trialing them getting those lessons learned and we also have a services called Metro Cell Express which is an even more product line a services offer that's going to help you get that integrated into your network as well. Okay, got a couple minutes to look for the rest of the team to weigh in there please. Yep. <coughs> so it's in uh, is, 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 I think it's a believer of uh, heterogeneous networks so it's, it's absolutely required uh, from a capacity perspective and to get the true capacity into the users. Uh, but there is multiple layers. So obviously we believe that you should maximize your macro network as much as possible. And then have layers which are work, working in coordination with the macro network, uh, whether those are you know, mini cells, remote uh, radios, uh, pico cells, and also you can't forget about Wi-Fi and have that where it works in coordination with the macro cell to maximize the overall. The final count here. Yeah, so we are a proponent of uh, small cells. We are deploying small cells. They are absolutely needed for the additional capacity. You know, the deployments are going to be different for different mm -hmm. operators, especially, you know, the, the guys who have spectrum in multiple bands. Uh, you know, they can use the higher band for small cell deployments. So the deployment is going to be much easier. It's going to be more difficult for guys who don't have enough spectrum and they're deploying small cells at the same spectrum. So there will be some issues. Talk backhaul is going to be a big issue that we need to solve. And we are looking at different techniques, uh, especially in online side wireless backhaul. So, but you know, uh, small cells are here and we are deploying. That's one, one comment there. Yeah, we're definitely promoting justification through small cell and heads head net. In fact, we just acquired a small company called Designer out of Israel to uh, bolster our small cell profile. Uh, they have an SOC today that provides LTE access as well as back wireless back call. Um, to echo some of the comments made, I think really important is to have that intelligent system selection between 3G, 4G, as well as Wi-Fi. Uh, and it has to be done in a way that's transparent to the user, but also doesn't degrade battery from 2G. Well, we're at our, our time stop for this part of the discussion. Joe, I want to make sure we hold enough time for you two. So next, uh, Joe and Joe, I think you have discussion coming up. Uh, we'll turn it over and then we'll save some time at the end for questions. Well, actually, while they're setting up, does anybody have a quick question for the uh, panel before we break over? Okay. Good. So we'll give you a chance to ask some questions. I'm sure some of you have some burning questions, so I'll make this real quick. But we know that one of the hottest topics today is roaming. We, we're seeing a lot of interest. We just did a webinar about a month ago, and we're going to be doing some follow-on webinars because there's just a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to LTE roaming. And a lot of the leading LTE operators are dealing with this issue right now. And we don't really have any global LTE roaming yet, uh, but uh, we're working very hard as an industry association with all the folks here on the table and much more, many more to implement it. So just to throw you a little softball, 
Um, I have a chart here related to implementing it. It really is driven on a timeline as shown in these bullets here where you gotta have the spectrum assigned first. And I'm not referring necessarily to the United States. I'm talking about Latin American countries and certain Asian countries. Until they have the spectrum assigned, that's the first step. And then they have to deploy the network, certainly. But what's really important is they have to provide that same ubiquitous coverage that we currently have today with 3G to really make that roaming footprint uh, valuable to them. And so that obviously these are common obvious points, but the real crux of the matter that we're dealing with in LT roaming is in the device. But then after you figure out which devices to use for LT roaming, we're starting to see real dynamic and complex roaming agreements, nothing like we've ever seen before. This is a chart that shows you the first point, what spectrum assignments have been made. And it's really interesting to see because there's two outliers here. If you see that one column of green, that's band class three, that's the 1800 band. And these are the leading operators around the world in some of the largest countries. So you're starting to see a co co uh, operators coalescing around the 1800 band. And then took at the very, the, the very bottom line, you see the United States of America. And you start recognizing that a lot of the man assignments here in the United States don't even match anywhere else. That's not good. If you're trying to do LT global roaming, that's not good. So the way you're going to have to roam is obviously with multiple RF links. So how's this going to look at, uh, in the future? And this is a great chart that came from Tolaga Mobile Market. I really like this chart. What you've got to look at if you're a small tier two and three operators, well, who do I partner with? Do I go with Verizon Sprint or someone else, AT&T? And which frequency assignment should I deploy my LTE in? So one of the first decisions is what band class do you deploy LTE in? And you have to look at the future. And what we're starting to see is there's really four band classes that are coming out, uh, showing up as being outliers. And that's the uh, 700 band. But in that particular band, you might get misconceived, it's a little misconceiving because that 700 band is broken up into several band classes. And one of those is the Asia Pacific Telecom band class, which is a new band class that hasn't even been ratified yet by 3GPP. And that includes the band class 12, the 17, the 13. So 700 in general, but it is a fragmented uh, uh, band class assignment. So you really don't see a lot of economies at scale there, but they're starting to see some 800, mostly in the European nations, but not really as much as you'll see in the 1800 band. The 1800 band is an unused band in a lot of markets, and I think that will be a very key roaming band in the future. And of course, the 2600 band is a great roaming band because that's a spectrum that has been unused. Unfortunately, it's a, it's, it doesn't provide good coverage, So, um, but you will have that uh, RF link in most of your global roaming devices. And uh, Joe from TNS will get into some of the device issues on that, as far as that goes. So there are certain things you have to do if you move to LT roaming. And first and foremost, I'd like to suggest you've got to keep the current roaming income and preserve that. Keep that income going. Don't mess up what you're currently paying, in, uh, your, you know, it's paying employees, keep the lights on. So keep that 3G roaming revenue going. Preserve it as you deploy your 4G uh, roaming. And keep in mind the customer experience Keep in mind that you gotta keep that coverage, and it changes. Certain operators are refarming spectrum, and so one day you, they were your roaming partner, they provided that roaming footprint, the next month they don't even have that roaming footprint anymore because they just finished refarming that spectrum. Obviously devices, which we'll touch on with Joe, and affordability certainly is a key thing. I think they will hit that on, on, on some of the tariffing. You're gonna start seeing some real consternation when it comes to data roaming rates, if you travel globally, you already know that it's unaffordable and you immediately look for Wi-Fi. And that's not going to get any uh, better if we uh, have the fragmentation that we're seeing in the LTE roaming area. Certainly building out your revenue. And, and of course, we had a discussion today about voice over LTE and circuit switch fallback. And we still need to make sure that reliability for voice services, which is critical to the consumer experience, is sustained. And then this little diagram here, you notice that the very center of it is all about device capabilities. That really kind of drives everything else. And everything I just mentioned earlier about spectrum farming, uh, the roaming partners and what their plans are, et cetera and so forth. You're going to have a lot of new roaming partners. If you're a CDMA operator and you're going into LD roaming, you're going to start opening up to a lot of new roaming partners. And then you're going to start seeing the consisting roaming partners that have changed the plans. And then to end, I just want to let you know that this is an area where there's a lot of education, there's a lot of information that you need to pick up. Uh, the CDG has been do it, is an industry body on a global basis. We've been doing roaming for a long time. We also do device aggregation on a global basis to help in this respect. We just had a meeting in Mumbai last week. If you're in the business of implementing roaming for your carrier, you've got to meet the people that you want to roam with. And it's changing all the time. So if you're not in that social network, 
then you're going to be missing out. You're not going to know what their real plans are. And then we have an exchange and information tool that we use to keep everybody up to date on what Sprint's doing, what Rise is doing, what China Telecom's doing, and what Reliance is doing as far as their uh, spectrum coverage, as far as their roaming agreements, et cetera, and so forth. So that kind of a tool you need in addition to the uh, uh, networking that you do within the international roaming team. And then also to help uh, raw operators uh, deal with it, we have a roaming paper here that talks about CDMA, LT roaming. It's quite technical and quite uh, important, so I'll have this on the chairs up here front. If you're into roaming, you can pick up this paper or you can download it on the website here. So now I'll turn it over to the other Joe from uh, TNSI. There's nothing that you're supposed to see there. There we go. So uh, thank you guys for your time. Um, obviously the uh, device capabilities is at the heart of the solution or at the heart of the matter for today's discussion on how we move forward with uh, how we see uh, common LTE bands in the majority of the devices today. So roaming as we know it um, in today's environment is um, fairly much a closed door. And, uh, the operators are looking to open that up and, and so we see multi-band devices starting to show up on the higher end uh, which, which leads the operators to some choices on steps that they can take and um, some near-term steps that they can take. In this particular scenario you can see where uh, you know, higher end device manufacturers are, are targeting uh, the multiple bands and solving these problems for the operators. This is starting to open up intercarrier services um, to where operators can re-leverage their existing footprints. Specifically, uh, there are, uh, are three different devices that uh, we're seeing that are driving a number of uh, uh, initial conversations on who to select and target as roaming partners and in which band classes you can start to align um, as was mentioned earlier, be careful with uh, um, where you're headed. Be aware of what spectrum blocks are opening up so that you can pick your partners wisely. If they're going to be different partners than what you've um, historically done business with. Um, and along the way, um, the broader scope of, of what band classes are going to be available are going to drive um, where, your, where your roaming revenues will come from. I think the, the team, the, the folks in the panels have already highlighted on this fact of, of how disparate um, the band classes are. The rest of the world has done a good job of uniting and standardizing and within the U.S. Uh, there still continues to be um, disparity in how these bands are being uh, picked. And so this is what's driving the complexity in the devices uh, where, where, the, where the U.S. is uh, going to continue to challenge the, the global roaming um, opportunities in front of us. So. As these selections are being made, um, keep keep in mind what the um, um, regulations are going on with uh, maybe some of your ideal or preferred organizations that help align to those. Um, so earlier today we had talked a bit in a previous workshop about accelerate and roaming um, for some of the CDMA solutions. You've already invested. I think you heard Rob talk about the. Uh, using the packet core in innovative ways uh, for uh, new applications and new platforms. Uh, that's absolutely at the heart of what um, TNS's and carrier solutions are designed to do and, and enable. I think that the carriers will find more creative ways to um, further maximize their existing cores today. And then as they uh, bolt on the next generation packet core, um, the evolved packet core, um, the operators that, that are funding these high-end devices would look to um, operators in the regional markets to extend their footprint. So as a natural step to your current environment, as you upgrade the packet course, look at is that an opportunity to, to grow and drive roaming revenues. So that um, although the devices might not be there for you um, to, to capture, uh, to maximize the spectrum, there'll be other operators that, um, that could use it. So let's take a look at those opportunities for you to expand the uh, economies within your um, Roman ventures. And then as, as um, the devices um, 
are propagated and the device capability issues <coughs> continue to be resolved. We highlighted a few of those earlier. Um, it will open up more LTE on LTE roaming scenarios. And I think that just as soon as you start to become comfortable with that, you're going to find smaller cells as being a requirement. How you doing? Good. You need to wrap up and move on to Q&A. Do you have any closing comments you want to focus on? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we've got 10 minutes left for Q&A with the operators and uh, some of the partners here today. So we'll open it up. And if you don't have questions, I've got about 30. So uh, please uh, feel free to, it's a great opportunity to have some questions. But before we start, I just wanted to comment on this I think it's relevant for provide some perspective on where we're going from our perspective. So today's generation of RF I see that's found in our current LTE chip shipping today um, has some limitations on how many high and low bands it can support at any one time and what combinations it can support at any one time. But where we're going on the next gen, which will come on next year, actually we'll see a, a major expansion of the RF bands that will be supported in the single chips. We're getting closer and closer to supporting that single skewed device that will address all these um, band, global bands um, against this backdrop, I think, and should put some light at the end of the tunnel for uh, some of the problems that the OEMs and the operators are facing, uh, which will allow them to kind of take the shackles off and start to really get in deep into the agreements with their partners. Can you expand on that in terms of specific initiatives that you've got in place or underway to really bring these multi-mode uh, LT devices to better guys? Well, just, you know, the next gen of the RFIC, which is coming out. In 2013, we we'll just have a, a lot more flexibility with how many bands it supports. So the OEMs won't have to necessarily do multi configurations to address different regions. They can maybe make a single device, <coughs> which would allow obviously the op more operators to take a single SKU, helps with inventory management, and then also if everyone's taking the same SKU, you can start to talk about roaming deals in a much easier way. Well, clearly, at the heart of the cog wheel was uh, for devices. And then we've heard a lot about spectrum and lack of harmonization as it relates to the North America plan. Uh, one question I had was, you know, which band class do the OEMs think represent the best economics uh, for the competitive carriers? Any comments there? I think probably um, in the U.S., I think the AWS band probably will be the biggest common denominator as far as uh, LTE is concerned. I think. Uh, most of the operators have AWS spectrum, and uh, the majority of that will deploy, be deployed with LT, so that, that would be my pick in the US. Comments? No agreement. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Outside of the US, it's going to be band class 3 and 7 and APT. Okay. And probably AWS and Latin America. Yeah, Latin America has an AWS too. Which is a language USAWS, so that right. becomes a roaming band. So if you look at it, you can support about four or five bands. Depending on the roaming band and the size of the band, you're looking at four or five bands. Yeah. 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 Yeah
um, is we do want for all the bands that come out of 3 gpp it's just that the current, the first generation of chips that came out did have that limitation of how many high mode bands we would support. But I think I was just as surprised as everyone who saw the, the SIM slot in the, in the Verizon version of the, uh, the iPhone. Well, if, you, if you've uh, heard Steve Barry give his presentation, the interoperability, data roaming, are two of the top key issues. The third one is uh, our devices. Yeah. So maybe we can talk to the OEMs about what initiatives you have underway to help uh, the carriers secure access to these uh, uh, LT devices. So, yeah, we're participating <coughs> with CDG in the device aggregation. Um, we have people assigned to do that. That's very important um, to us. And then, you know, just as a customer's deploying, LTE, there's a long consultation period to discuss the feature sets with the infrastructure and the device partner uh, to, you know, what applications, what um, interoperability, roaming, what do you need, and we make sure that, you know, we're partnering with them and their uh, device partners so that we can IoT them together. So, yeah, I mean, about a year and a half ago, I think, with Ericsson, especially in the regional team, we figured out that, um, device availability is going to be the biggest issue. And I'm happy to say that we've actually done two device summits where we brought in all our regional customers and we brought in multiple device vendors and we aggregated that volume to actually give them, give the device vendors a way to bring in devices. In fact, I uh, uh, can't name the actual uh, manufacturer, but there was a you know, like a pretty big uh, device manufacturer who built a device specifically for our device. Our, uh, our region. So it is it is a big issue. It's a big <coughs> issue and one of the ways that we're trying to do is we're trying to get all our customers, all our smaller regional players and aggregating their volume so that it becomes more interesting for the device vendor to act, to the device manufacturers to actually build devices. And obviously we have other devices that we bring in from within Ericsson for like home routers and so on. So uh, I think you know the chipset is an issue, right? So, so you know we'll follow that, and then I think uh, CCA has a role to play here in terms of volumes. You know, if multiple carriers can band together, and you know guarantee some sort of volumes, I think that would go a long way in terms of getting the devices. Um, Rob, you guys have been real leaders rolling out the services, and, and certainly the, the, the iPhone has been a core product you're offering. What are some of the other um, LT devices that you've been successful in rolling out, and what were some of the catalysts for adoption on your, from your customer standpoint? Well, successful in rolling out is kind of a, a strange question. I mean, I have the MiFi. This is all we had for a, quite a period of time uh, in LTE because we couldn't get the rest. Uh, we are announcing this, you know, these weeks we now have the uh, HTC and the Motorola. Uh, and we're rolling those out, but it's slow in the process of getting them. Uh, it, it, there is nothing nice, nothing neat about it. Uh, I think as a small carrier, it's important, and, and, and as you said, I think we're one of the leaders in this arena. So uh, the other LRA members are also getting devices, but we've been really pushing hard to get there. Um, so how do we get to the end of the day and have a product that goes? There is a period of time where it's going to be tough because the standards aren't fully locked down. Uh, we don't know how the handoffs are going to work yet. We don't know what bands are going to be in there otherwise. So what we really need to do is be ready to move quickly, be a quick second mover, but don't abandon what we have today. CDMA still works very well. We do need to get to the point where we're using, I am absolutely committed to small cells because we need to get to the point where we can still have people use our networks. When they're overloaded and we don't have any capacity left on them anymore, obviously we have to move up to a new technology. Small cells is exactly what we did to be able to support what we have today. We had two cell sites in Brown County. We now have 45. Why? Because we need the capacity. There are more small cells on Sprint's network today than there are large cells by a multiple. And so when we look at that kind of technology, we have to say, how do we survive until everything locks down? We really need to optimize the networks we have today and very, very hard advocate to try to get this industry to lock into one. And Qualcomm's message today, I think, is one of the most heartening things we've got out there. We still need to get the OEMs to manufacture to their chipset and open up other things, make it more generic so we can get those handsets, because that is key to us right now. Hagel, any comments? No, I agree that it, it, it is a bit of a challenge. And uh, 
to get the LTE devices, and it has to do with the similar things that we talked about before. Do you choose CSIM as a provisioning, or do you not choose CSIM? And different, the, the, the big operators have gone different ways, so you have to you have to take your pick, and uh, e either you hit it or you don't hit it, and that that has to be uh, lined up with the uh, van classes that is needed to to, to support. So. It's been a little bit of a challenge, but, but we're getting there. We started to get access to to, to the LTE handsets now, so, yeah. Well, it sounds like a little bit of a chicken and egg. You've got to be ready to move fast, and uh, part of being ready, it sounds like it's small cell. Pay attention to the customer. So with respect to small cells, um, maybe you guys could talk a little bit about what percentage of your uh, PICO and micro and, and small cell deployments and transmitters are actually on utility poles, and is that part of your get ready strategy in your network ready by at the moment right now there's still a situation with the um, uh, the standards on uh, on hand in hand out and we're going to be working that out uh, yet this next year I think in our next release of some of the technologies so you're not seeing as many of the of the small cells uh, doing hand in hand out they're doing one direction but not the other uh, which makes it hard to deploy it as a, as a more commercial product but it is coming um, the other part that you run into is all that, that we're we're seeing right now big time because again there aren't a lot of radio manufacturers doing a CDMA small cell, um, but uh, we are finding that, that the residential product does exist. There is an enterprise product that doesn't work. There does work. I think we're going to see more in, in that arena. But percentages wise, now it's still in the early stages. The GSM side has moved a whole lot quicker than we have uh, on the CDMA side. But one other comment I would make, um, and I, I'm not doing an advertisement for Verizon, I don't even know if they would want me to, but, but the LT, or the LRA program that we got involved in was like, for our team, and we've got some of the best engineers, I think, for a, a regional uh, carrier, others have said it, in the nation. And um, it was like them getting a chance to go to a graduate uh, degree program on LTE. They sat down with the Verizon guys, who were the first guys to ever roll out the technology um, in, in a big scale. And as we're designing it, they're working side by side with our engineers, and we're learning more about LTE than we ever could have if we were trying to do it on our own. So if you've got white space, uh, you might give us some thought to it just from an educational standpoint. It's terrific. Any interaction, customer uh, questions from the audience? Okay. We are at the end of our session. Joe, I'll maybe give you uh, closing comments. Yeah, I'd just like to make a closing comment. First, thank you for coming, and hopefully it's opened your mind to a few of the issues and challenges and opportunities we have. And I'd just like to say, um, you heard the two operators in these, in these vendors are some of the big issues, and obviously subsidizing the devices is a key issue, and LTE roaming is a key issue. And having lived in CDMA for a long time and having fragmentation and implementation, it's a killer. And I think as a community, we have to work together on preventing that from happening again in the CDMA LTE community. And I'd like to throw out to the Competitive Carriers Association, which is a domestic industry body, if you want to get together and have a CTO summit where we get all of the CTOs together from the United States and the CDG and international bike can bring in some of the big players from CDMA from outside the United States so that they don't mess it up. Because you got to realize, if we're going to get very competitive LTE, we better line up with the Chinese and the Indians. And if we don't line up with those two markets and the Indonesian market, then can you imagine will we ever get to a sub $25 LTE device without them with us? And so I would throw that out to the CCA. We can set it up so that we can decide which way we go, CSIN, or we, you know, E, CSA, B, et cetera, and so forth. Everything that Agel mentioned, we did this once before with AWS, and Agel was with us when we did it. When ADS came out, we had no handsets, we all pulled together, we found handsets, and we can do this again with LTE. So that would be my closing remarks. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate your time.